the plan is actually Gunil's. And let me just start by saying that when Gunil was lying there flat, vomiting, basically un impossible to communicate with, uh, decentralizing things to the E-team, we were trying to hold her at a distance. But in fact, you know, my mobile was blipping two, three times every day with EAT-related SMSs. I would argue that EAT was part of your medication, Gunil, because your engagement, even in the deepest of chemotherapy, was absolutely extraordinary. So don't doubt this lady's commitment to this agenda. And in fact, you are at what I would argue at the platform of the most important agenda of our time. The challenge, the quest, of how to feed 9 billion people from healthy diets within planetary boundaries. And it is, just like Gunnar says, a quest which is uniquely positioned this super year for sustainable development. And it's not only that heads of state will meet three times to chart the future for humanity. As you all know, heads of state don't meet all that often, I'm sorry to say, on this agenda. So we will be determining our future for the next decade. And science shows, as John Schellenhuber will be pointing out, that in fact, the next 10 years are decisive to avoid that we trigger irreversible tipping points that could lend us a very, very difficult future indeed. And the starting point is the following, and which really sets the ETH agenda, which is the most remarkable story of how one species dominated the planet, the science around how we came to this position. And let's just put an x-axis of time and a y-axis on essentially all the pressures that we have posed on humanity. And this story actually starts 250 years back with the Industrial Revolution in the United Kingdom. And it explodes quite rapidly across North America, Europe, and Japan. This is a remarkable story of success. It's the urbanization. It's gradually the modernization of humanity. We come to the end of the 19th century and the first antibiotics coming to place in 1920. Vaccines, medical breakthroughs, enabling humanity to evolve in a way we've never seen before. The Haber-Bosch process invents fertilizers, which enables modern agriculture to feed humanity in a way we've never seen before. We actually eradicate and enable ourselves to move to a position we've never been before. But you see the point in 1950. Nothing is compared to this point. The point of the great acceleration of the human enterprise. We're three and a half billion people, 10 years after the Second World War. That's where we put in the high gear of development. And in fact, we start the Green Revolution of truly going to scale with feeding humanity. The economy grows four times during this period. We are seven billion people today. We have an enormous success story, but remember that the costs are tremendous. Right at this point here, the scientists, Mario Molina and colleagues, find the depletion of the stratospheric ozone layer. We're threatening the actually the life support systems on Earth. We're in the sixth mass extinction of species. Can you imagine, 97% of the weight of all mammals on the planet at this point, at 1995, is us and our livestock. We're actually warming the planet so fast that we're on an average trajectory towards four degrees warming by the end of this century, a place we haven't been for the past four million years. This is the big challenge of recognizing at the point of the top of this great acceleration that getting it right on food for both people and planet is probably the most decisive way of turning this hockey stick exponential pattern in a pathway that will enable a future for humanity. And we're right at this top of these curves and dear friends, we have entered the Anthropocene, a whole new geological epoch where we humans dominate and are the largest force of change. And the evidence is really scientific. It is observations of these exponential pressures on the planet. And you can pick any parameter that matters for health and food, and they all look the same. Up to the Great Acceleration, very little pressure on the planet, and then off we go. So it's not a surprise that in 2015, with all this evidence, we can say for the first time that we're the first generation to know that we are risking the entire stability of the Earth system, and therefore our own future. And we're probably the last generation to have the possibilities of a solution. But the exciting point, which Gunnar points out, is that the transformation towards a healthy and sustainable future within planetary boundaries is a journey of attractive success. It is possible, it is doable, and it's a more attractive future. And that is what sets the EAT agenda. The EAT agenda is positioned within the science on planetary boundaries. It had a very recent update, as you may be aware, in 2015, where we're actually today able to set a safe operating space for humanity. And the critical point of this is that you find 
that among the nine boundaries that regulates the stability of the planet, essentially all of them are related to food. Climate change, biodiversity, nitrogen, phosphorus, fresh water, land use systems. In fact, we can say that agriculture is the single largest contributor to the risks we're facing. But we also know that things are moving so fast in terms of the challenges and opportunities we have. Gunit pointed out that this year is the year we'll be locking and agreeing on the Sustainable Development Goals. This is the result of the world's largest open consultation ever held on planet Earth. It is an agenda that sets out to eradicate poverty, to eradicate hunger, to enable good lives for all people and the right to development within planetary boundaries. If we take this seriously, it is a transformative agenda. It is an agenda that will really take us to a new future. And again, food will be the heart of getting this right. Eat Therefore has embarked since the last forum, and I really want to thank those of you who were here last year, that we did exactly what we set out to do, to pull up our sleeves, sit down and set an action agenda for a platform and a movement for change towards healthy, sustainable food items. We have pushed this forward very actively on metrics, feeling that that is probably one of the first flagships of how can we take science-based quantifications of what defines healthy and sustainable diets and plug that right into the Sustainable Development Goals indicator work. And that is work going on right now. We'll have a competence forum on it. The advisor board yesterday also agreed that each should actually produce a thematic report, the equivalent, as you may recall, of the World Resource Institute's early days of the state of the planet or state of the world reports, to be able to produce really policy-relevant, business-relevant, state-of-the-art thinking on cutting-edge areas on our agenda. We have now agreed on the seven research themes for EAT. And I really want to emphasize that the purpose of this is to be action-oriented, to bring forward analytics and knowledge of relevance for business and policy. They relate to diets, they relate to levers of change, they relate to food systems in the Anthropocene, and also what are the governance measures for transformative change. We've identified three of these as fast-track areas. The first one, as I already mentioned, on metrics. We're actually having a a development of a project together with Chris Murray and the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation for the first time to mesh together sustainable and healthy metrics. Brian Wonsek, who's here with colleagues, will be pursuing the consumer behavior theme together with business players to see how can we understand better how we can transform preferences, not only in the developed world, but also in the developing world towards more healthy and sustainable diets. And finally, the multifunctional landscapes work, which we're working very closely with the CJR system. And Frank Reisperman is here, the CEO of the CJR, together with colleagues around resilience and sustainability. How can we manage landscapes in a way that really delivers resilient and sustainable food for poverty alleviation and development in the world? This is built on consultation. It is built on a whole series of EAT events over the last year across the world, but we also have a whole lineup, as you see, on EAT events into the coming year. So you're coming here this year to sit down in a working session together to really fill this with content, and that is really exciting. We've set up a new website, which now is much more rich in terms of also content, not only in terms of the events we're running, and particularly the science area here, I'd really like to welcome you to have a look at that to see at the content agenda that we're now developing. It is a work in progress, but it's largely in place. We are engaging very much with those of you who come from business. One very inspiring success story is the multinational supermarket chain, Rea Mathusen, who took the inspiration from last year's EAT Forum to also integrate much more profound work, continuing their good work on how to get more healthy consumer patterns in their supermarkets, based, for example, on alleviating the buy three for two kind of marketing um, strategy. So that's quite an exciting way for science and business to engage. I find this to be a remarkable success story of how EAT works with the Norwegian Football Association and, and Bama on an EAT move sleep effort of trying to get perceptions among young athletes and football players to change towards looking at sustainable diets as a strategy to become a successful football player. And this is something that can be movement, a movement across the world. Now, where are we then to close in terms of our agenda forward? Well, the next decade is charted out in a way. We are in the most decisive moment of human history on Earth. 
Food will be the make it or break it for our prosperity and for the sustainability of coming generations. As Gunil says, no group of people are better placed than us in this room to hold hands and work together towards this agenda. It's absolutely unique to have science, policy, and business to engage in this way. Let's do it. Let's be concrete. Let's really work on activities, projects, funded and working together towards getting solutions on the table. Next year will be very exciting in terms of the SDG agenda, in terms of the climate summit running up throughout this year. And these are issues that will be coming up during these two days. And finally, what will we do here? Well, we have a working agenda together and we very much look forward to engage in, in concrete terms for action and knowledge building together. So um, wonderful to see you all here and uh, looking forward to have some really creative days together. Thank you very much.